James Comey, a polarizing man for a polarized time. Hillary Clinton says that he cost her the White House. Donald Trump just called him an untruthful slimeball. Now he's sharing his story about standing at the crossroads of the most controversial election in modern history. You say it's a dangerous time in our country. I think it is, and I chose those words carefully. I was worried when I chose the word dangerous first. I thought, is that an overstatement? And I don't think it is. Why not? I worry that the norms at the center of this country, we can fight as Americans about guns or taxes or immigration, and we always have. But what we have in common is a set of norms, most importantly, the truth. And if we lose that, if we lose tethering of our leaders to that truth, what are we? I've talked to a lot of people who've watched you for a long time. Some of them come out with, with this storyline on James Comey. Here was a guy who loved being FBI director. He got fired. He's angry. I get that. I mean, I get why people would think that. That's just not right, though. Welcome to election night 2016. What a crazy campaign this has been. In his new book, A Higher Loyalty, Comey describes the fateful decisions around the 2016 presidential election. Where were you as the returns were coming in? I think I was home that night. And the first states are in, so let's get right to it. You didn't vote? No. Why not? I'm the director of the FBI. I'm trying to be outside of politics and that I shouldn't be choosing between the candidates. Look at that, George. <laughs> Donald Trump is back in the lead in the state of Pennsylvania. I was surprised. If he wins Pennsylvania, it is president-elect Trump. All of us were operating in a world where the polls were showing that Donald Trump had no chance. He is now going to be the 45th president of the United States, the most stunning upset in American political history. And what part of you is thinking, I helped elect Donald Trump? A whole lot of me was thinking, oh my God, did we have some role in this? Did we have some impact on the election? Well, what does your gut tell you? I don't know the answer. And in a way, I care about the answer, and in a way, it doesn't matter at all. I really wasn't making decisions based on political fortunes. On a cold winter day in January, Comey heads to Trump Tower to meet with the president-elect for the first time. Were you nervous? Yes. What were you afraid of? I'm about to meet with a person who doesn't know me, has just been elected president of the United States. From my watching him during the campaign, could be volatile. And I'm about to talk to him about allegations that he was involved with prostitutes in Moscow and that the Russians taped it and have leverage over him. It was the first time you met Donald Trump. What was your impression? He had impressively coiffed hair that looks to be all his. I confess I stared at it pretty closely. And my reaction was, must take a lot of time in the morning. His tie was too long as it always is. He looked slightly orange up close with small white um, half moons under his eyes, which I assume are from tanning goggles. Comey and a group of intelligence agency heads were about to brief the president-elect about a disturbing report on Russian meddling in the election. What was their reaction? President-elect Trump's first question was to confirm that it had no impact on the election. Then the conversation, to my surprise, moved into a PR conversation about how the Trump team would position this and what they could say about this. That's just not done. You also said you were struck by what they didn't ask. Very much. No one, to my recollection, asked, so what's coming next from the Russians? How might we stop it? What's the future look like? There was none of that. It was all, what can we say about what they did and how it affects the election that we just had? You said as this was happening, you had a flashback to your early days as a prosecutor. I had a flashback to my days investigating the mafia, La Cosa Nostra. Decades earlier, Comey learned about La Cosa Nostra, our thing in Italian as a U.S. attorney prosecuting the Gambino crime family headed by John Gotti. In the Mafia, a man is measured by the strength of his loyalty. There's a distinction between a friend of yours and a friend of ours. I felt this effort to make us all, and maybe this wasn't their intention, but it's the way it felt to me, to make us all a Mica Nostra. We're all part of the messaging. We're all part of the effort. The boss is at the head of the table, and we're going to figure out together how to do this. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. And I don't do it lightly. And I'm not trying to, by that, by the way, suggest that President Trump is out breaking legs and shaking down shopkeepers. But instead, what I'm talking about is that leadership culture 
constantly comes back to me when I think about my experience with the Trump administration. Do you think you should have said something then? Maybe. And I think the reason I didn't, I hope is obvious to folks, is that I was about to stay behind to talk about allegations of the president being involved with prostitutes in Moscow. And I thought, that's got to be my focus. He was about to tell Trump about the Steele dossier, salacious, unverified, and so explosive that Comey suggested everyone else leave the room, which they did. How graphic did you get? I think as graphic as I needed to be. I did not go into the business about um, people peeing on each other. And he interrupted, started talking about it. You know, do I look like a guy who needs hookers? I didn't answer that, and I just moved on and explained, sir, I'm not saying that we credit this, I'm not saying we believe it. We just thought it very important that you know. What was the look on his face? He was very defensive and started going into the list of people who had accused him of touching them improperly, sexual assault, and how he hadn't done this, he hadn't done that, he hadn't done that. Did you tell him that the Steele dossier had been financed by his political opponents? No. I didn't, I didn't even think I used the term Steele dossier. I just talked about additional material. But did he have a right to know that? That it had been financed by his political opponents? I don't know the answer to that. It wasn't necessary for my goal, which was to alert him that we had this information. Did you believe his denial? Honestly, never thought these words would come out of my mouth, but I don't know whether the, the current president of the United States was with prostitutes peeing on each other in Moscow in 2013. It's possible, but I don't know. How weird was that briefing? Really weird. I just wanted to get it done and get out of there. Right after leaving the meeting, Comey began to take notes about Trump's startling behavior, fearing that the president-elect might later lie about what was said. I had obviously concerns about that earlier, having watched him on the campaign, that he is someone for whom the truth is not a high value. The story of how James Comey came to have that meeting with Trump begins in an unassuming house in Allendale, New Jersey, a suburb of New York City. How old are you here? I think I'm about six in that picture. And I was rocking the bangs. <laughs> Wasn't working in the 60s either. But my mom cut our hair, and that's the way she cut it. Describe what life was like in this house. It was fun. My father always made it his business to be here for dinner. And you'd have to talk about what happened to you during the day. But in that house, an armed intruder broke in, terrifying 16-year-old Comey and his younger brother. You say it changed your life. How? It gave me a tremendous sense of urgency and the preciousness of life. It also gave me great, great empathy for the victims of crime. The boy would grow up to enter the elite of law enforcement, Manhattan U.S. Attorney, Deputy Attorney General under George W. Bush, and finally, Director of the FBI. It was the job of a lifetime. Then came the 2016 election, where his decisions have been blamed for changing the course of history. Your critics say this is where your ego got the best of you. This was your original sin. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.